The Clown That Takes the Bow According to the National Science Foundation, the average human being has about 50,000 thoughts per day. Despite this, we as a society and as individual thinkers know almost nothing about what thoughts actually are or even where they come from. Because of this, we almost never question the contents of our thoughts by asking the deeper questions, such as, should I believe everything that pops into my head? Are my thoughts a reflection of who I am as a person? Am I the voice behind the thoughts? This last question is a tough one, since the very asking of it appears to be a contradiction. After all, I am using that voice behind my thoughts to ask myself whether or not that voice is me. This paradox usually stops the question from ever being asked in the first place. This is because we are conditioned to believe that we are the voice in our heads. I mean, it's a reasonable enough conclusion, right? I am the only one who experiences my thoughts, after all. What could be a better indicator of who I am other than the images and words that appear in my personal mental space? What could represent my true self better than the internal dialogue that narrates and interprets every moment of my day? To answer this question, we must return to the previous question of where do thoughts come from? There are two major theories about what generates thoughts. One of these theories, what is sometimes called the self-created theory, is predominantly a Western perspective on the subject. The second major theory, which we will call the mind-created theory, is more abundantly found in Eastern schools of philosophy. The self-created theory argues that you are the voice behind your thoughts. According to this theory, your thoughts are a direct extension of your ego or identity. Your character, personality, likes and dislikes, so, within this model, if one were to have a thought that's considered by society or religion to be impure, this impure thought would be considered a direct reflection of the type of person you truly are. The self-created theory is the theory most of us grow up subscribe to, especially if we grew up in a religious household. Those who believe in this theory, consciously or not, tend to be vulnerable to feelings of shame and inadequacy because they feel personally responsible for each and every thought that arises, even those thoughts that contradict their deepest moral convictions. The self-created theory also proposes that there is no randomness in the thoughts you experience. If you have nefarious or disgusting thoughts, then there is supposedly something nefarious or disgusting about your character, morals, or desires. In other words, every thought is a direct reflection of who you are. As you can probably see, this way of thinking has a tendency to produce negative consequences for the perceived thinker. Everything from neuroticism to narcissism can be born from this way of seeing ourselves. This theory puts a tremendous amount of weight on the assumed thinker of thoughts, and tends to cause more attention to be given to the negative thoughts than the positive. This is because thoughts carry an enormous amount of shock value when you assume they stem from the core of yourself which makes the bad thoughts infinitely more disturbing, scarring the psyche. Due to the very nature of the way this self-created theory operates, I find it to be an exhausting and terrifying way to think. To be constantly ambushed and criticized by my own mind and constantly deduce shameful conclusions about my character does not sound like a good time to me. Fortunately, there is an alternative way to look at thought. The mind-created theory is the second major theory on the origin of thought. This theory states that instead of being the creator of thoughts, you are a witness to them as they occur. This theory also insists that thoughts are random, involuntary suggestions generated by the brain, rather than definitive truths about the nature of who you are. As it is the job of the lungs to breathe, or the stomach's job to digest food, the human brain is an organ which is tasked with generating thoughts. It's just what it does. These thoughts are not personal in the way the self-created theory would suggest. And even though we experience a thought monologue nearly 
they are not necessarily a representation of our inner self. As Alan Watts puts it, the mind grows thoughts as the field grows brass. If you've lived your whole life as someone who believes themselves to be the voice in your head, you probably will have a lot of resistance to believing this theory. The self-created theory is hard to let go of, since you're not just letting go of negative thoughts about yourself, you are also letting go of identifying with the positive thoughts as well. Rupert Spear was once confronted by a listener experiencing the same resistance, and I think his response sums it up nicely. Quote, In retrospect, we look at the succession of thoughts and a thought, which is just thought number 10, looks back and imagines that there is a chooser in the system between each thought. That chooser is just thought number 10, it's not actually there in between each of the thoughts. The chooser itself is not there in between each thought, choosing each time between a range of possibilities and saying, I'll have this thought next, and then I'll have this thought. The notion of a chooser is simply itself a thought, which, as you say, appears retrospectively. The thought that says, I was there in between each thought choosing it, it's the clown that takes the bow. It wasn't actually present, but it claims responsibility afterwards. As Spears suggests, the notion of a chooser of thoughts is itself just another thought. It does not exist as an independent entity. There is no real chooser of thoughts, and the assumption that there is a chooser is simply just another thought. Sam Harris echoes Spears' conclusions nicely. We are not authoring our thoughts. We can't choose them before we think them. That would require that we think them before we think them. The mind-created theory concludes that instead of creating thought, we simply experience it. We don't get to decide which thoughts bubble up to the surface and which sink to the bottom of the mental lake. This confusing suggestion is nicely summarized by David Kane. Almost all of our thoughts are involuntary. Just like how we can't help but hear sounds that happen near us, or see whatever objects appear in front of us as we move through the world. Thought is like any other sense in this way, and it's helpful to think of it as one. Thoughts simply emerge into your present moment without any invitation from you. If we include thought as a sense, then it's the most prominent one of all. We're having thoughts nearly all the time and they easily take over our attention and trigger emotions in us, whether we want them to or not. If we really take a closer look at the experience of mingling our identity with the contents of our thought, we might discover that it is the source of most of our suffering. This identification causes us to take our lives overly seriously and leaves us at the mercy of emotional reactions triggered by random thought. Because we can't control what we think, this self-created theory puts its faith in an unreliable ruler, who spends more time stumbling around in the dark corners of its own mind than in the light of reality. But if we can learn to acknowledge that thought is randomly and spontaneously emerging from the river of memories that is our mind, and that we did not purposefully create them in most cases, we free ourselves from their weight. Suddenly, we don't have to hold on to thoughts, grasp for them, scold them, criticize them, or even feel ashamed of them. We realize we don't have to waste our energy engaging with every thought that arises. There's no reason to. They don't belong to us. We can simply observe them as they appear and then watch them fade into the void. A lifelong subscriber to the self-created theory of thought might find that adopting the mind-created theory leaves a large gap in one's identity. If I'm not my thoughts, who am I, after all? I can't answer that question for you, but I'll ask you this. Isn't the question, who am I, just another thought? In other words, you're not the one who asks the question, but you are the one who knows the answer. <laughs>